special forces have had females within within its ranks for years and years. Let's just say Gina's played a role in the British military. Skidded off the road in the middle of a minefield and, and, and <laughs> in the middle of winter. How are you, sister? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, all, all the better for seeing you. Yes. <laughs> I'm I absolutely delighted you come on the podcast. We met at the Veterans Awards. In fact, we actually met for the uh, promotion photo video shoot that they, they did a week before up there on, um, was it HMS Victory? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Nelson's flagship. It was an incredible experience. I mean, it's incredible to be finalists in the in the in English Veterans Awards. And I met you, and immediately I thought, "Oh my God, what a lovely person!" You know, what 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 a really really nice person. Um, subsequently, we've we've had the awards. Um, I've been listening to a wonderful podcast that you that you did this morning. I'm. I'm honoured that we have a female on the podcast because we we just don't get approached enough. I don't know. I'm not going to conjecture why one, you know, as to why that is. But as I, I said to you earlier, you know, I wish it was 50-50. But um, what I do know is you're not a stranger to hardship. I know that you lost your um, your brother and we'll we'll – we will talk about that. I know you've done incredible things. I know you serve with the Royal Signals. I'm also privy, friends at home, to information about Gina, which we're not going to talk about. Um, because, uh, well, we're just not. But uh, let's just say Gina's played a role in the British military that uh, I think you can probably work work out if you're a bit savvy. But... Um, we must uh, respect our guest wishes. And um, yeah, so first off, how, how did you find the other night? It was all a bit of a, I, I found it all a bit of a blur. Yeah, I mean, it, it, as you say, it was, it was amazing to be finalists there. Um, and, it, and it was a brilliant, um, brilliant venue. Uh, the, 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 the thing at Portsmouth a few weeks before was, was probably the height of it, really, because we got to speak to each other where the, the actual evening was a bit of a blur, wasn't it? Because it was sort of all rushed and then hearing about people's amazing mm. stories and what what amazing community, the veteran community is for helping others. You know, some of the stories were outstanding, weren't they? Um, it, it was a true honour. Yes, I think a lot of people that have, I've seen message me, so they're a bit confused. They think it's about like what you did in the military, and I'm like, no, we're we're, we're civilians. <laughs> I don't know about your capacity, Gina, because yeah. you 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 still serve in a, a is is that a cadet thing or like you still wear a uniform, don't you? Yeah, so I still wear a uniform. So I'm it's kind of part of the reservist, but not so. Where are um, adult instructors for the Army Cadet Force. So we teach all the military skills that you will learn when you're in. Um, and and they, it's just a, a fantastic youth organisation, really. Mm. Um, you know, keeps the kids off the streets, if you like, get some new skills from everything from first aid to shooting to field craft um, and get some, some CV qualifications so it looks better on their CV. And obviously... If they then decide to go to the, into the military, then they've got a bit of a head start because they, they've got all the knowledge. You know, when they leave at four stars or master cadets, they're, they're pretty awesome at, at most of the military skills. So, mm. yeah, it's, it's really um, appealing to your worthwhile organisation to join as an instructor. <laughs> so, And you get to wear the uniform again, so that's nice. a nice honour to, to put it back on. What, what's the experience of being a woman in the British military? Yeah, so I joined in the in the mid nineties, and 
to be fair, because I joined the Royal Signals, they'd always really had women since since you know there was racks and they they were always attached. So they were they were a very adaptive core for for females. So you didn't. I mean, it's a it's a sensitive su- subject, isn't it? Is that there was some sexism in there that you know there's there's going to be because it because there's only like i think there was maybe 20 percent females 80 percent males but as a whole I, I don't really think i was held back that much you know mm. f- for being female because because of the core i joined and and it was very forward thinking um you know it was it was it was pretty equal really mm. um with it all, how we were treated. So I didn't really experience any, any, you know, I've not, I've not really got a bad thing to say about it. When I, when I've worked with, with other regiments and that type of thing, then the, some people who've been predominantly like, you know, a Royal or, um, you know, infantry, they do find it difficult to adapt around a female for some reason. Um, but I guess when you when you're out there, you're the only female, so you just sort of tell them, "Look, just treat me the same," and I and I'll crack on with it. Um, and eventually, you, you know, you'll get the respect like any new person joining anything. Really, you've got to prove yourself that that you're one of the team, haven't you? Yeah, of course. And let's not forget that you know there's some really impo- <laughs> important roles that men can't fill. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. um, whether that be, I don't know, you know, the, the military's a whole whole range of things, but I mean, least not of which, you may, if you have to go undercover, well, a bloke can't be a woman. Well, they could probably in this day and age, they'll do a bloody good job, but... but yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you do get away a lot more with being a female, I think, especially mm. in roles like that, um, which which is why, you know, we've had, we've had females... Beyond the front line since, you know, probably the First and Second World War, who have who absolute heroes for what mm. they've done. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, it's always an interesting debate. Um, females within the army and, and, and now it's, you know, uh, I think it was about a year or so ago, they've opened every role up to females and we've had the first female para um, pass, um, which you know, good luck to her. It's not something I'd I'd want to put myself through, <laughs> um, but you know, each their own. And and I certainly, if I had my time again, I'd still probably join the Signals or the Remy, you know, and 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 be in that type of role. Um, and 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 the things you can do are exactly the same as the, the males, really. And and it's proven now. I knew the first female. This doesn't sound much. First female liney. And the liney trade within the signals was like, you know, that uh, trade, and they had to have big cable drums and and that type of thing. And one of the tests was lifting its big cable drum up above her head, and she was training for the whole time to be able to do it so she could pass. I mean, it wasn't an official one, but you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> she wanted to fit in with it all. Um, but yeah, definitely, there's it's 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 right. There shouldn't be any restrictions. Um, and and if and if you're fit enough and strong enough to to pass the pass the courses then then rightly so you know mm. um each to their own so. yeah it is interesting i think if you look at sweden they've their special forces has been open to female applicants and they've had they've had operators um that have obviously passed is is what i mean um yeah. I've, I've looked a bit at the marines i'm not like massively into it's not like i don't like wake up in the morning and check <laughs> how many women are now Royal Marines commandos. But apparently they, they've had, um, it's something like about 500 applicants in, in that re- But of course applicants and people that get through to even begin training is, is, um, is, uh, massive, yeah. you know, that thins an awful lot of people out. They've been really quiet at Limston. I, I don't know if it's cause the first, um woman that came through i think she was an olympic athlete and and of course the press just went crazy didn't they um which yeah, is um, that which was is, a few years ago wasn't it that yeah which is just unfair because yeah. you know does anyone want to be in the toughest thing in their life and 
and they've got the whole of the British press just trying to exploit them. So I do, I do wonder if I they've made. The, the first one. Yeah, well, the first, the first one to do anything, I suppose, is is always an under the limelight. Um, you know, um, so so the press are going to make a big thing about it, but really they should they shouldn't tell until afterwards. So it's not, mm-hmm. you know, always oh, she passed or failed or, you know. Yeah, I do wonder if they know. put put some sort of press well, ban on def- there. Because... Definitely, does that once once that it. So go on. Yeah, I was just saying. Yeah, yeah, they probably are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder if they put some press ban, which they should do because it's not not fair on the individual. Because I've you you don't hear anything more about it now. So I don't even know if there's um female marines now i mean maybe i mean well there's always um female marines because we've got the cadets i think the band service god i'm showing my ignorance here i'm not sure if we we had women in the band um but i certainly don't know if anyone's passed out of limps and i've 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 not heard of it but yes yeah i mean i I think there was there was, I think it was Pippa, like in the two thousands, tried for for the Marines, but I'm not sure whether she passed, no. um, really. But I suppose I suppose the main thing the military needs to do is just not make a big thing about it. Um, which you know, as, as you alluded to, the special forces have had females within within its ranks for years and years, and they they don't get any dispensation whatsoever. We you know they pass the same course. Mm-hmm. And as you say, you know, it's like an, a 2% pass rate um, if you're lucky. So mm. it's um, if, it, if you want to do it, I think a lot of it's the mindset. So, yeah, we, I'm never going to be as physically and strong and fit as a Royal Marine um, bloke because of physiology, no matter how much I try to pack on the weight. I'm always going to be this 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 build, as is some some guys. Um but a lot of it's mindset because you'll see people break and you think, why have you just broken and, and you know, rang the bell or whatever the, the, the sedition is in different places. Um, and and I'm still carrying on, but you're much physically stronger than me. So it is a lot, as you I think you've, you say on a lot of your podcasts, it's mindset that gets the human body to do amazing things as opposed to um your body will take you so far but your mind's got to take you the rest of the way really mm-hmm. so so you've obviously well, been Gina you've sorry. been on you've been on operations many many operations like we're talking active service now folks and so obviously you've been alongside your male counterparts if that's the right term op- oppos yeah. <laughs> Did that ever throw up any, you know, people like bothered about going in the shower or? or... No, I mean, you just you just you just sensible with it, aren't you? I mean, I don't I don't like sharing the shower with you know, I just don't like those open showers. I don't think anybody does. So it's kind of you just have a different timings for it, don't you? So you know, you go, I'm going in the shower now. So. When you've like one of your showers is just like literally a bucket around the back of your Land Rover or something, and that's, that's just give you each each pair some privacy, don't you? Yeah. I like the gear. They just they just you know shower in their in their underwear. So and that, that's that's how they they traditionally you know shower with people. So is there's always ways around it. Um, really. That was that's what the Gurkhas do. Is that what you just said? Yeah. 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 So yeah, so I say I served with the Gurkhas um, quite a lot because I was in Thirty Signal Regiment, which has a Gurkha squadron attached to it. And also, when I was in um, East Timor, that was with two um, Royal Gurkha regiments, mm-hmm. um, and that they we we were like ten Brits, and the rest were all Gurkhas. So we got to know their routines pretty well. But yeah, they they always. Um, shower even when they were in barracks because the, the lads would say that they always shower in in their underwear or because because that's part must be part of their religion really so mm. um, 
Yeah, they're an interesting bunch. So, Gina, tell us about the Royal Signals, because we all know about the Royal Signals. We've had um, signalers on, on on the show, but what what's their main role within the British Army? Yeah, so obviously it's the obvious one to, to provide communications across the globe. Um, when, when we were particularly, I was lucky to go to a regiment which was classed as the Globetrotters. So wherever we'd be deployed, we would be de- the British Army would be deployed. We would be deployed pretty much straight away with them to set up comms back to the UK so the commanders could have um, real-time conversations with with the UK command. Um, so that's sort of the operational side of it. Um, when the operations stretch, which the obvious one is Bosnia, I suppose, um, then we put we put harder wired into structure in so it, it's more like a more stable network um within peacetime if you like back in the uk we we obviously um look after all of the the network systems and the command systems that that we use all the in, all the internet um which is which is generally done by ourselves um and then we we have exercises like everybody does where we take out the mobile stuff um and and it's it's an ever-changing role and and the year the years i was in was were really really interesting because comms were were booming everywhere they were everybody was trying to get raw signals to leave the army and join join these you know amazing companies that were set up everywhere trying to trying to rule the world in comms and um it was just a really interesting time because because I was one of the first people to put television conferencing across the internet, well across the, the network, back to the UK, um, and we did that in East Seymour. So that was like groundbreaking. That was like Star Trek stuff because we didn't have this. This didn't exist in the nineties, and it, and it was it was it was amazing. It was amazing, groundbreaking stuff that we, we did that um, quite geeky. <laughs> and how we f- see it now, it, it, you know, it's to a penny. But at the time, you know, the, the commander there um, in charge of, of um, the British Army was was like was made up because he could he could they could all have this conference back with with HQ land HQ over. Um, so it was, it, it was really interesting times to, mm. to see the developments of bombs from a geeky mm. point of view. Uh, it's not all guns and bullets, um, <laughs> you know, and, and it is it has been since the first Second World War, one of, one of the, you know, um, biggest things that does help win the war. Because because if you know what what we're all supposed to be doing at the right time, then the plan goes hopefully um, well. And, and then, then we have the, the secrety side of it, where we we have the interceptors and code breakers and the sneaky beaky ops and that type of thing, which is another interesting world, which is where the intelligence is gained. And then we 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 sit in with the ink core, and it kind of merges that world between the ink core and the signals. Really mm-hmm. incredible! It's incredible to think. When I left in 1995, I didn't even have an email address because I, I didn't know what the internet was. <laughs> I, it was just being talked about. Um, I don't think I had an email address until 1998. Uh, how 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 warfare must have changed um, with the advent or the inception of the internet. Someone should write a book about it. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah it, it is incredible because I remember sat in Northern Ireland with a, it must have been a laid line internet. I had just found out about this thing called eBay um, <laughs> and I was bidding on something, but it took like about five minutes before the internet got along the cables and updated and then to see whether I'd won this bit, bit of rubbish that I didn't really want anyway, but it was a, a draw to it. Um, yeah, and, and I didn't have an email. Probably just when I was leaving, I probably got an email because, you, you know, you didn't need them, did you? And you were made up if you got an email. Now you, you open your thing and you've got probably about 20, 30 junk mails. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can't get away from it. Yes, <laughs> yes. Gina, talk us through your operations because uh, – you know, well, the ones that you're 
the ones that you can um because you've certainly been in the thick of it friends at home gina has a rack of medals that's just you need a compass to navigate them <laughs> they, they just keep going that is it that way or that yeah um yeah so i was i mean it's, it's interesting because as, as a soldier i'd say i was lucky because i got to go on these operations when you mm. when you say it now you're a bit older you think god was i lucky or was i you know <laughs> um young and whatever um but yeah i always wanted to get five medals that was my thing because it would fill my chest up but i've got a few more than that <laughs> but, but you know um yeah so literally i'd, I'd finished training and my training was was 14 months because i was an engine uh, communications engineer and I, I got to my regiment and i did like a month of guard as they always do they stick it on a month of guard because you're a newbie and then i was in a in a like a an o group and they were like um yeah, Atkinson, you're um, you're um, going to Bosnia, and then gave me a date, and I was like, no, this can't be true, because I'm like new, and and signals tend to go to places on their own a lot of the time. So at at the end, I went up to my troop staff here and went, is this right that I'm going to sort of Bosnia next week? And he was like, yeah. I was like, oh my god, you know, <laughs> just straight out of training, and I'm getting sent there on my own. Um, so, so that that was certainly um, for me um, a, a reality check that I'm not I'm not just um, going to be sat in barracks fiddling with with radios and stuff. So um, I was sent over to Bo- to Bosnia and and it was it was pretty pretty calmish then. I was involved in um, the um, the arrest of Slobodan Dimitrovic. Dimos- Dimos- Kovic, is that the right one? Um, which was really interesting. Not obviously actively, um, more of a, a supporting role. So that was a really big part of history, and um, proud to sort of be part of that. Um, but that that was interesting because because I was an engineer, I had to drive everywhere to make sure comms were still in. When they'd go out, I'd be called out in the middle of the night and have to drive nine hours across theatre, um, and had some. Hairy times then, although it was was kind of class of speed peaceful because it was S four, um, skidded off the road in the middle of a minefield and 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 <laughs> in the middle of winter, and yeah, probably didn't do what we should have done, but we survived. So um, luckily, we we kind of judged that the ground was so frozen that if we just tried to retrack our st- our skid marks out of it we should be all right um where realistically we were supposed to stay um and wait for rescue or or you know do the old knife thing out but we probably would have froze to death if we'd done that um yeah so <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, I, I we did it and it worked but um i wouldn't advise it to anybody um do, do, you do what you, you, you do realize this is is a major contrast between your counterpart who might like work in an office doing a bit of you know typing yeah <laughs> um and they'll probably do that for you know pretty much their whole life or a bit of customer service or, or and and you're in a minefield <laughs> deciding whether to get your bayonet out and and <laughs> yes yeah yeah and it's what it's what makes um uh, what makes those stories um uh... <laughs> Oh, and you've had a couple of beers and you forget about them because you just like I'd completely forgot about that story till we've started chatting. Um yeah, and 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 that was a really good tour. Um, you know, I, I got I, I always when I when I'm on tour try and if I can help the local community. So if there's things set up, I will try and do it. So um I used to go and see the orphans. Um when when I had some downtime I used to go and, and you know, play with them and and chat to them and and, and that that that's the you know the reality of war, isn't it? Because you you do see that is quite heartbreaking, um, but um, but also you know a good thing to do. I remember we used to take chocolate bars and I had a, a big box of Twix Twixes and I got there and they were all running at me and I was handing out the Twixes and this this one little kid came up and his face was covered in chocolate and i was like you've had fun and he's like no 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 miss no miss and i was like no you have and he was like no no and i, I obviously had to give him one because it was like the cheek of it was, it was brilliant you know um so 
so yeah, that's what I I I I'd like to feel like I'm I'm engaging when I've got the opportunity. And luckily, you know, on most of my operations, I've I've been able to 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 have an an impact or or try and help the local communities. So um, yeah, so Bos- Bosnia was good. Um, I kind of got back from Bosnia, um, and then Kosovo was kicking off. Um, that's at the start so i was there from the very start when we were we went to the s pod in macedonia uh, not macedonia and um, greece and um, Thessaloniki, um and then we we all drove in like the the, the biggest um military convoy in history i think it was um and we we basically drove in stopped in macedonia um got some abuse from the from the locals um into Kosovo, and then I ended up. Um, our detachment got posted to um, Albania, where the refugees were. Um, which, which again, we helped set up the refugee camp with with the engineers. They helped like build latrines and stuff, and and that that was that was um, that was you know, um, Ukraine really rings rings through with that because you get to know the displaced people or the refugees and and see the real impact of war you're not just you know a squaddy on a gate or doing your job um you're seeing families reuniting that for each other were dead and and yeah it's um it, it was it was a definite um groundbreaker you know, just to, to see it, and when we were there, we we would get involved with the the community events, and and they they were so, and they didn't need to be thankful, but so like thankful that we we'd come in and helped them, and then we we would like, you know, we set up a football match, and some of them didn't even have trainers on, and they still beat us, and we found out that there was a few Kosovo um, national side in there, so so we didn't stand a chance. Um, yeah, so that that was pretty pretty good. Kosovo's, if you like, uh, Co- Kosovo's been um, I don't want to say kicking off. It's probably a bit strong, but they they've had some issues recently, have they not? It comes down to number plates that apparently I'm I I had to I spent a whole day just reading up on this to try to get my head around the complexity of what has gone on in in you know, in that part of the world and former Yugoslavia and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there was something about there were, I probably got this wrong, but Serbs driving around with Serbian number plates and they've been allowed to do this because it, you know, nothing was made of it. And then in recent times, the Kosovan government went, nope, you've got to have a Kosovan number plate. And it, and it caused, yeah, it caused a bit of an uproar and there were, militia on the streets and um for, fortunately it doesn't seem to be anything that's come of it but um well i mean when you got home did people understand what was going on over there i think i think with with wars and stuff unless you unless you live in it and you're there you don't really ever understand i mean you can you can read the history and listen to the ops brief before you go but unless you, you live in it daily you 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 ne- you're not really get, ever going to get it, you know. For, for example, we we all live in the UK, and and most probably I'd say probably ninety five percent of the UK don't get what Northern Ireland is all about, no. apart from the people who are living it. So mm. yeah, and 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 it's like, do we ever get? If I'm trying to be c- cynical, do we ever get to the truth of what the war or whatever was really about? Was it down to <laughs> money and greed or? I'm glad, so- I'm, I'm glad you said that, and uh, <laughs> that's that's normally my part of shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we yes. could get we could go off on tangents on that definitely. Mm-hmm. So, and that's cynical old age and reading around it because when you're when you're a, a soldier, you know you you train to do what you do and you go and do it. Um, particularly, you know, um, the American Army are, are a fantastic example of this because they 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 don't question the narrative no matter what if if yeah. their boss tells them to stand there all day they're that kind of institutionalized that they will do it no matter what where, where 
the British Army is, is not as bad. They will sort of question things, but if, if we start questioning things, and they, we're not going to be an effective army, are we, really? And that's that's why we're all young when we join, I think. So. Yeah, well, they say, don't they, you know, you shouldn't be able to join the military until you're 50. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then we know what the recruiting numbers would 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 be like. Mm. Yes, um, East Timor. I, I can you tell us about that? Yeah, so East Timor. Um, I, I I was basically told I wasn't allowed to go on any more operations, um, and I needed to stay in barracks and teach the mm. new the new guys you know, the kit. So I was a bit gutted about that, but I was on, you know, do you remember the old COs PT where you get beasted before, before they send you away on a weekend? Um, and I kind of got a tap on my shoulder from my troop staffy and he kind of went, you lucky bitch, you're, you're going to, because <laughs> that's our mentality in it. You're going to East Timor. Um, and, and it was just a whirlwind and, 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 from we were sort of gone within twelve hours because it was that rapidly changing. So the the mm. the the problem with East Timor is the East Timorese wanted independence from Indonesia, um, and the UN were there to oversee the voting and the militia or the Indonesian army, whatever way you look at it, um, were basically going around chopping. The public's heads off and intimidating them not to go and vote. Um, so it, it was a, it was a nasty, nasty kind of. It wasn't a conflict, I don't think. It was a nasty time. Um, and the Australians were the lead nation, um, but they hadn't really done a, a lead operation since Vietnam. Um, so we were kind of sent over there to support the Australians. Um, and give them some guidance, and um, this is what I was told. So, if there's any Aussies listening, and that's wrong, <laughs> this is what we were told as Brits. Um, so, there was a small contingent that went over there, and we were there from D Day. Um, we had an um, S Pod in um, in Darwin, which was lovely to get to go to Australia, for, but I didn't get to see much of it um, and then we we all flew over to East Timor and set up and and it it was really um so one of my favorite um programs was MASH when I was a kid mm. um and and um that's maybe why I ended up joining the army and it and it was like scenes from you know from Vietnam or or you know the Korean War from TV that it just felt like we landed um you know there was there was it was it was derelict the place it was totally taken over by military and um, we drove into the streets in our soft skin land rovers <laughs> and and there was there, it was just derelict there was houses on fire and um, there was there was a Gurkha patrol i remember going along the streets um and uh yeah it was just totally what you envisage your war zones to to be like um because most of the indonesians um timuri sorry had, had fled um <clears throat> to to what we found out later to the jungle um and and when we when we got into our place where we were going to set up barracks it was an old um government building which had been totally looted and ransacked um and as we we pulled in we started taking um incoming fire um so it's kind of like you know this this is getting real um so we all you know debust um started taking cover and giving cover of fire and that type of thing um and i remember because we hadn't been issued flat jackets um we we all we had was our helmets and i remember being behind this wall thinking well the wall's not going to really protect me should i put my helmet on or not and I, I, I remember going through slow motion thinking, well, there's no point if I've got my helmet on because the rest of me is all exposed. Um, yeah, so that was sort of welcome to East Timor. Um, and then sort of later that day, um, we, we, I was on guard on the front and uh, a building blew up opposite me, um, which, was, which was crazy. And we had... Um, all the civilians, I was trying to get them out the way of it. Um, and the BBC was there within seconds 
with a mic in front of my face and I, I probably sounded like a dumb squaddy if, if it got put out because I was just saying I don't know what happened you know the narrative that was told to, to say um, and then um, I think one of the, the the SES were over there the commander of the SES came down and spoke to me to see what had happened and sent out a fighting patrol yeah and I, and that was that was the first sort of probably 12 hours of East Timor Um and I actually had a diary and, and I'd forgotten quite a lot because I was reading through it a few months ago. Um, so it, it was pretty full on for for a fair few weeks. But it, it was classed as the military's most um, successful sort of mission and op within the 20th century because we had no mission creep. And it kind of went from from total like like crazy war carnage to total tranquility and it you know um we destabilized the, the country within quite a long you know short periods of time um and we were back home for christmas um tony blair let us home um and and that was us job done i believe the um the aussies it became a bit of their bot like their bosnia they stayed there for quite a while um, but as part of the British military, we were kind of in and out. Um, well, yeah, it was, um, yeah, some some probably dark times within it, but but I think we did a good job over there. Mm. Was that your hairiest moment in everything? I, I know that some of it we're, we're not going to speak about, but uh, uh, as boots on the ground, was that your hairiest moment? Yeah, probably. I mean, th there was quite a lot of times we, we thought we were going to get attacked and we were on stand two um, and that there was a lot of militia about to start with. Um, so when, when we, we sort of went up to, we found uh, the displaced people in the top of the jungle. So we went on a, a mission to bring them back. And that was, that was I think that was more intense thinking we were going to get attacked the whole time um, because we were, we were, you know, sitting target if you like um but yeah sort of the bat baptism of fire in the first 24 hours was probably a reality check really so and Gina, you've served in Nor northern ireland yeah um can you tell us just as an insider from the signals regiment um was it corporal woodson house is 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 that kind of like folklore in sorry i should start from the beginning when, when we went to belfast in 89 it was 89 um like literally as we were doing our beat up training uh one of our corporals jan very very nice man from my home city he came into the office he went lads look and he had this double page spread from the paper and it was that horrific incident where these two there's there's dispute over this but let's just say there were two british military undercover who accidentally driven into a, a funeral cortege um an ira funeral and, and very quickly the crowd realized these two are not part of us and the taxis quickly moved to block the it was it was horrible and it was all televised there was a, uh, a, a camera in in the sky and, and i won't for the sake of the podcast i won't you know repeat what happened but i think people can you know um can imagine for themselves and uh, I, I remember patrolling past penny lane um one day and that was the place where you know these two poor chaps said said their sayonara through through no choice of their own um but i've heard different things over the years i've heard that they weren't signalers that they were uh, you know on special ops or something um it is i'm only mentioning it because this is my podcast and i'm a bit fascinated <laughs> obviously i'm fascinated with stuff that happened in my life whether whether you heard anything about that, Gina, or what, how that is talked about in the regiment? Yeah, so that, that, they were definitely signals because we've got um, a memorial um, in Blanford, which is the home of the Royal Signals. Um, when when we're over there on ops as signalers, um, 
which you think where the confusion maybe is with the you know myths and stuff. We we wear civvies because we're out mm. in in the population because we we go out and fix the comms, um, which is which is no real secret now. I don't think, um, but they they were definitely signalers and 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 it, it was a dark time in the core and and the. The, what I've been told from the core is they were they were handing over to each other. So one was leaving theatre and the other one was coming in. So he was driving him round, showing showing him the area. Um, mm. And then, unfortunately, they took a wrong turn and it was all just pure, pure, horrible, horrible bad luck, really. Mm. Um, whether whether they'd ignored anything. Is is debatable. Some people say they they tried to get to see a funeral, but who who will ever know? With you know, we're not going to speak to them, are we? And and it no. was watched and filmed from the police helicopter. Um, so it's all it's all on there. But at the time, apparently, the police thought it was one of their own and didn't know it was military, uh, because we we probably didn't have that good of comms, or we didn't know they were in the area. Um, so sadly, they they lost their lives in the most horrendous, torturous way. Really, mm-hmm. that just like un- unbearable to think. But yeah, so so they they do have a memorial in Blanford. If you, if you go, if you you know want to go to the Royal Museum, Royal um, Court of Signals Museum in Blanford, it, it it's just outside the museum where you can see the memorial. Yes, it. Um- I don't know what kind of HD they had back then, but the the chopper footage actually show one of them the magazine dropping out of his pistol, and one of the theories was he'd gone to hit the safety catch, but hit hit you know the magazine ejection button. In it, yeah. it was um they uh, they had Brownings, didn't they? And they were they were pretty they're pretty not not the best pistol, are they? Um. And I know they did get a warning shot off, but then they obviously had a stoppage. Um, and then, then I mean, they wouldn't have stood a chance either way. With you know, you've only got what nine nine rounds in each one. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you can't help but think. No, if I was the chopper pilot, I'm just speaking for my. I would have just landed on top of that car. <laughs> Yeah, but but then you don't know how much room was in the chopper, do you? Might have just been one of those tiny little things with room for a, a pilot yeah. and his co-pilot. Uh, yeah. But I'd say grab hold of the skids, guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was just horrible the way the chopper just hovered, and we and everyone had to just watch the whole thing. Well, you didn't have to watch mm. it, but obviously we were just about to deploy. So, um, yeah. yes, gosh. Gina, let's talk a bit about your um your charity efforts and 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 your cycling and let's talk a bit about skiing because that was military skiing was one of my favorite favorite things when I when I served. One of the few things I've been good at in my life. <laughs> um yeah. but your 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 brother died of cancer. Yeah, so we were in, in 2019 he, he was diagnosed with 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 cancer um bowel cancer i mean uh, totally he, he was a fit and healthy healthy lad you know um he he um he was diagnosed with it and it sort of ravaged through his body within four months and covid didn't help because covid then started um and and some treatments were stopped so you know you suppose you have to think he, he would have died anyway just would have been prolonged um yeah so he he tragically died of cancer um which which for for me it kind of makes you realize like you you know you're not immortal are you um Mm. and and was was quite a quite a low time for myself um and I'd, i'd always used um fitness as as a lot of us do um for to get rid of my stress um, and and kind of just before it was actually a day before my, my brother died I'd just been to see him um, I would go for a bike rides and then I, I got I ended up in A&E because I got hit um, luckily you, you, I just you had got, a few you got hit by a hit and run driver yeah and then 
and then I ended up in A and E. Um, weirdly, my mum was driving past a few min- moments later, <laughs> um, so I got in with her. I, I was just going to go home, and then it just you know when things start getting worse, so, and I was bleeding a bit, so I got her to stop at a, a chemist and started wrapping myself up, and then I was like, no, I need to go to A and E. I think, um, but yeah, I was okay. I just had like really badly bruised bones and needed a few stitches um and then as every cyclist will know the first thing you look at is your bike <laughs> my bike was so destroyed and i was gutted and uh, you know because it because it's your pride and joy um but then the, you know the next day my, my brother my brother died um so i mean he, 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 you can't say he died peacefully, but he, he, he died, if you like, when, when he went on his decline, he died quite quickly. Um, and then I, I, I started, what I normally do is I, I started a year-long task to raise money for the charity that had helped him. Um, so I was doing 100 miles a week at that time, sort of trying to run, walk. Um, couldn't really cycle because my bike was busted. Um, and I... I Reached out. I think I was speaking to Health Heroes at the time, and then they put me in touch with Safa, and Safa amazingly um, got the funds together to to get me a new bike, um, which is why um, after the year long task of like riding five thousand two hundred miles, um, I'm running mm-hmm. so bits and bobs. I raised ten thousand pound and set up an art foundation um, for cancer patients, so they can they can de stress. Or, or try to, you know, and not thinking about the disease all the time. Um, so that's up and running. Um, but I wanted to give back to SAFA um, and, and Sporting Force because I'd done some events with them. And then I joined up um, the Royal Signals in 96. Went all around the world with, with them and then carried on, did my class one um, and then went to Northern Ireland and then specialised from there. Because I went on operations with, with uh, Bosnia and stuff, there was... There was things that were not particularly nice about times but when I was away on operations I always felt that I was there to help I always volunteered for extra things so I remember going to Bosnia and helping out at the orphanages it was amazing to go and and see these kids and give them a bit of joy you know they, they do so much for serving families and veterans you know um I mean they are the I think one of the biggest they've been around the longest so they've got they've got good good you know methods to get to get the to get the funds for the right people at the right time really um yeah so so I wanted to give back to them but thought I can't I can't do another road race or something because that's just normal um and everyone's doing it and and whether you've got the time so I decided to put a book together um by veterans for veterans to show what people do through the military. Um, and also there's a lot of people within the military who, who may, or veterans who may not have the time, you know, to run around the UK or may not have the ability to, to go and do a marathon. So it, it was an other outlet for somebody to, to express and kind of give back. So I, I put this book together, which to make it even easier, I'd said I'd do it in poetry format. Um, and and the book um, is, is a be- beautiful thing. I've got an artist to illustrate the, the people's poems and it kind of, I've even got a recruit, Josh, who's now in the Royal Marines band um, and he was a recruit at the time. So we've got from recruit all the way through to joining the army operations and then leaving the army. And then we've got um, volunteers and family members that have also wrote, written poems about how the military has mm. affected them or effects them all. Um, so it's a lovely book. Everything goes to charity. We've been in the top ten a couple of times um, for British poetry. We kind of keep bumping in and out at the minute. Reflecting back over my career, but I had, uh, I had a really, really brilliant career, to be honest. Um, it was probably everything I wanted to be fair, which is probably why I only did 12 years and then I, then I, then I left at the right time. Um, and it's just mainly, you know, it's not going to make millions, but what it does do is raise the awareness of, of SAFA and Sporting Force, which is another great military charity that, that does stuff through sports and um, for veterans and serving personnel. And um, 
and yeah so and, and it's also given me a platform as well to be able to you know speak to the likes of yourself um and and i've done guest speaking in front of you know the first the first admiral sea lord is that what it's called i'm um, being army i'm like getting it wrong um that's all right I'll, I'll do it the other way around <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um uh, you know and mps and like amazing people that are you know i've stood in front of a thousand type vips and and shared my story and about the wonderful work that that military charities do and raised um you know touching nearly 300,000 now um for SAFA and other military charities so so that that platform from this from the, this is the book from this from this really mm. you know small small thing that actually probably would have been easier to climb Everest to than to write a book because <laughs> that's totally alien to me um but yeah so it, it's doing good it's the, the the poets that are in it it's more like a little community and, and we I try and keep in touch with them and and get them to do bits and bobs um and then and then from from then I'm, I'm still doing crazy crazy challenges so my last one was um 50k a day for 30 days um which was a killer <laughs> i've kind of finished my 50k that sort of whenever I would finish it, it'd take me for like three hours probably normally to do it each day if I did it in a one and I'd be yeah. like, oh my God, I've finished great. And then I'd be like, oh, I've got to do it again tomorrow. <laughs> that is some going because it took me 36 days to run the length of Britain. And I, my goal was just to do an ultra marathon a day. So anything over 26 yeah. miles. I didn't do a lot more than 26, but when I got there, I'm like, right, that's me. Let's yeah. put, put, put my tent up, yeah. <laughs> get some food on. That is, that's, um, that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I did a lot of it actually on in, indoor on, on my indoor bike because it was during the heat wave and I, I'm, I'm big into, um, I do a lot of animal rescue and stuff. So I've got three, three, three dogs. And one of them had, that day had a, had a massive mm. fit when I just started it in the heat wave. So I was actually doing it in a conservatory on a, on, on a bike during 40 degrees heat because I had to stay with my dog cause, to make sure he, you know, didn't fit. But yeah, it was, um, yeah, I, I, I must have needed my head testing when I came up with that idea. But <laughs> I suppose it's the same as doing mm. an ultra every day. I mean, I've done, I've done a few ultras, but every day, yeah. Your body kind of gets used to it though, doesn't it? I suppose in a weird, weird way. Yeah. The biggest, the biggest problem was the admin, you know, having to talk to people and arrange things and like, where am I going to get food, water and, and all that stuff just took like, you know, trying to do Facebook posts. It just took so, so long. But uh, Gina, what was your brother's name? Um, Spencer. Spencer. Well, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Condolences. Um, you're, you're, Absolutely doing him proud. He was having a bit of a hard time because my me, me brother was going through, um, at the time, cancer treatments. Um, and I was having to help him a lot. He got taken off his cancer treatments to, due to COVID um, and got given weeks to live. And I was there when he died. I, I, I think I was the last person to speak to him the day before. And he, and he was just really positive. He was Royal Navy Reserves for a lot of his life, and he was he was um, he was always he he, he finished. I mean, uh, because it was COVID, we couldn't have a funeral, but it was amazing what they did. They lined the streets for him, the Navy, and um, and all the people who we worked with, and it and it was um, it was amazing. He had the Royal Legion there and everything um, because we, we he was a popular guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think I think because he was, you know, he, he was fifty two when he died. Hence me doing fifty two weeks and mm -hmm. you know all the numbers things. Um, but yeah, the, and but the main thing he he, he always said um, was, you know, you've got to you've got to live your life and and to the max really, and and that's what I do try to do. And then when life events like that happen, it, it makes you you do it even more, um, and that's that's why. Now I think I'm driven to just, you know, doing doing what I enjoy and and which I'm lucky enough to be able to do do 
have to work now and again. Um, and I'm raising money for for charities and and stuff. You know, the other day I was in, uh, um, well, basically in with a load of rescue pigs and mucking them out. And so it's not it's not all good and glamour. To be fair, I'm I'm more about being in the mud, really, which probably most of us squaddies are. You know, so wherever wherever I can help, I try to really. Mm. Um, and, and maybe that's my problem. I never say no anymore. I keep, people say, can you do this? And I'll go, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, yeah, I think we've all got to learn to say no because people will, will take, take, take from you. And, and gosh, it, it can really backfire. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway. I, I mean, I, Matt, I've just made, um, made um, the calling it charity champion of um, – a dragon boat team that's for veterans um so that that's a, a brilliant um thing it's called Purple warriors um and they they basically they they get veterans together and get them out on the um on the dragon boat so it's like a real camaraderie thing um so i'm trying to bring awareness to that because they you know the more the merrier and we we take them to national events and my background with that is i i used to be in the british dragon boat team um, and we won three gold medals, so so they kind of brought me on board to, to try and raise the awareness. But that's a brilliant if you if you um it's sort of based near Staines way, but you can be anywhere because they meet up around the place. So that's you know sport um, and fitness definitely brings us all back together and brings us that that camaraderie, isn't it? Have you been in Hong Kong? No, but if I had, if I was at the time when I was a gold medalist, I'd have been like a pop star. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because oh, oh, sadly not here. <laughs> when I lived in Hong Kong, obviously the dragon boat races were a big thing every year. But yeah. the but the year I was there was the year that many people were getting taken by sharks for just it was this uh, random summer, yeah. um, and it was in the paper almost daily for a while there was several several there was divers that got eaten there were people swimming in the morning da, 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 da. and when they filmed the dragon boat race the chopper that was looking down on the races <laughs> switched like that and there's a big bloody tiger shark just swimming <laughs> swimming ne next to it was uh yes <laughs> yeah yes. at least the dragon boat quite stable I wouldn't have wanted to be on a um, stand-up paddleboard. That's for no, sure. <laughs> no. Gina, tell me there are a couple couple more things I want to ask you. But how's your mental health been? You know, after all, all this service. I mean, I, you know, I, I've not hidden <laughs> my challenges yeah. over the years, and um, yeah. So I, I, I what at the same time, my brother was. I was diagnosed with cancer. I was diagnosed with PTSD around the sort of same time, but um, obviously all our all our concentration went on my brother, and and that was that was a tough time at the same time. And I have I have sought help through um, help for heroes through their their kind of counselling system. Um, but I, I I my coping. My coping mechanisms is is I suppose by by talking about it to people um, and and also um, by by throwing myself myself into challenges and fitness and that that's kind of I think what's always kept me sane is is having a challenge whether that's a healthy way to do it I suppose better than alcohol um, which unfortunately a lot of the armed forces do get addicted to. Um, I didn't realise that it was um, a coping method, to be honest with you. It, the, the bike's really important just to get out. I mean, when I didn't have it for those few weeks, I, I felt like my, my legs had been chopped off. You know, I, I, I didn't have an outlet. So, yeah, I, I, I can totally relate with it. And, and, you know, it is one of those challenges that, that some of the armed forces do face. Um, but I think it's... If, if you like, it's getting better because we we can talk about it now without without that real stigma, um, and people understand it a bit more, don't they? You know, because it has ruined lives in the past, and and you know, people are still 
committing suicide because they're not getting the right help, which is which is tragic. That you know someone serves the country and then they can't they can't cope outside of of the military because um, mm. they're not getting the right help. Uh, really tragic. I've had I've had quite a few friends who have who have been on the edge or you know lost as in lost their family due to their behaviours and and then then had to seek help, which is kind of too late, if you like, because they mm. well not too late because they're still breathing, but you know they have lost everything really, and I, I think it's I think it's better now because there's a, more of a support system when you leave. Because I know when I left, it was just basically see you later type thing. You'll be back in six months because you won't make mm. it. You know that sort sort of squaddy squaddy sort of humour. Um, where now I think. I think the forces do give them more of a care package, if you like, when they leave. Where where the old days, it was like off you go, you desert her. <laughs> yes, sort of. yeah. it's ironic that you know the stuff you do in the military. You know, you learn some powerful stuff there, and you you come through a lot, a lot, a lot of tough stuff. And my message to anyone who's struggling is: come on, come on, don't forget where you've been. You've done this, you know, you've done it before. It might not be, you know, you've had challenges. You will come through this, mm. you know, just keep the faith. Look at us. We've all, we've all been there. Um, you know, hang yeah. in there, find someone that, 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 you know, cares about you and, and that's got a level head and just chat with them. Yeah. I, th- I think yeah. a lot of people think maybe, um, I was speaking to Daniel on that, that podcast and he sort of said to me, you know, the, the worst thing you've been through is the worst thing you've been through. So you shouldn't really look at what others have been through and go, you know, God, he went through that and he's lost his legs and he's, yeah. you know, he's worse off than me. With with the mind, it, it, it's a completely different yeah. ball game, isn't it? Because the worst stuff you've been through is the worst stuff. And sometimes... um some things affect you more than others. Like I remember, because I, I used to have a, spe- a specialist trade within a trade. I was I was like a medic, so I was like a paramedic um, trade. So I was like did chest trains and tracheotomies and all that type of thing. And I had to be attached to an A and E every year. Um, so I got the choice between Manchester or South Africa because they were like the best places for stab wounds. <laughs> so, but I obviously chose chose Manchester because it was close to home and and. I, I, you know, you see some terrible, terrible stuff because it's A and E, isn't it? Right. Mm-hmm. So, but the worst thing that got to me was a little old lady that had been brought in, that I, that had broke her hip and laid there for like two, three days without anyone discovering her, and that totally like made me have a wobble because I was mm-hmm. just, I was just so upset about this little old lady. So you just don't know sort of what what triggers things and and that mm. that's I suppose why the brain is still we're still discovering stuff about it so people hopefully this, the stigma isn't there as much and people can um get out and talk about it i think i think uh, male female thing females do talk about it more um generally just how we are as as our whatever well, females chat more i don't know talk about mm. crap more um but uh, and then you could argue that a lot of us maybe don't see as much from the military aspect um but you know you've got police and paramedics that that are all equal and do the same mm. sort of jobs and i mean I think um, just get get help really isn't it reach yeah. out even if it's to a friend or you know or you know you know me or you and you send a message i've had people message me late at night that I don't even know and, and you know it's it's my duty to, to try and speak to them and keep them keep them on board and try and point them in the right place because I'm no expert. I mean I've done my mental health first aid but I'm no expert on it mm. by by any means. So it's just about connecting with your friends when you know that they're they're low, I suppose, isn't it? Mm. Not it's to have also, another- Gina, there's this big myth that I get this a lot. I get a lot of messages and it's, and it's the complete reverse. I get a lot of people say, Oh, well, I was never in the military, Chris. I've never been what you guys were, but, and I just say to anyone, childhood trauma is the worst trauma to experience. And many of us 
people have been in the forces, we went through it. And this big part, the reason we end up joining the forces to find some meaning, you know, in our lives. And I just ask everyone to understand when you're a kid, you're a toddler, you don't, you got no control over that. What adults do to you, you got no control, right? And you're, uh-huh. you're, a, you're in an age where you can't make sense of it because you're too young. So you internalize uh-huh. it and then, then it's bang. It's an, it, it's a, I'm not going to say it's a thing for life because obviously many of us find ways to, 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 you know, manage it. The difference between that scenario and a soldier who's an adult who signed up for what they do, they might go into conflict. Yes, they're probably going to see horrific, but, but you're an adult. You have the ability to go, ah, uh, right. And, and, and deal with it. But it's the, it's the toddlers that have had this horrible stuff in their lives and it's in there for life because they were too young to make sense of it. And the brain has buried it really, really, really. Yeah. So anyone out there going, yeah, Chris, I was no, no, no. It's the other way around. You, you, you know, everyone's story is different. There's no one trauma that's above. There's another, no one. But, but we need it. You know, we need a much more expanded dialogue on this. Um, in the early years, you, you, you know, I still remember the things I was taught when I was, you know, young. So it stays there, doesn't it? So you've got trauma. It's going to stay for a long, long time. And then you've got, because I work within the youth services with the Army Cadet Force, we do we we do lots of training on safeguarding and stuff. And some of the, when they get to trust you, some of the stories that you hear are, you know, horrendous. But at least they're speaking about it early so we can get them to the right place and and try and start that healing process earlier so you know our adults of our age potentially didn't have that that help or lifeline um i mean i remember esther ranson setting something up when i was young and that was pr- probably groundbreaking and the first thing but you know uh, some things these these kids go through is horrendous and I, I couldn't even imagine trying to take that into childhood mm. you know Gina, sorry, folks, we had a little break there. Um, three more things I want to ask you, but um, well, the first thing is I'm getting a lot of recruits email me and they're like, Chris, and we don't talk in specific terms, Gina, because we're not allowed to because of the platform. So if I say they don't want to get the the thing, guys, you you know what we're talking about, right? And my, uh, but they're going, yeah, but if I don't, I can't, my response is like, do you really want to work for an employer that has that little care about you, that they'll subject you to an experiment that is now proven catastrophically, catastrophically wrong for so many I mean, we're talking like two people in my family, I mentioned no names, they don't even know they've been affected. They, their doctors gone. Oh, da, 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 da. Uh, really? Mm. I've had yeah. three, I mean, three, my- three guests, Gina, on the podcast. Gone, Chris. I can't come on next week. Um, I'm having me leg chopped off because I've had complications because of uh, a certain thing. Uh, Chris, how are we going to do this? Because I'm, I've got to go on all this medication because I, when I had that thing, it's, it's. And I tell people, you know, it, 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 as harsh as this might seem, you get one beautiful body, you're born perfect. You're born perfect, right? And you don't want to screw with that. Not when you're talking about, like, you know, I'm just going to say DNA technology. I know it's slightly different, but but you you like, oh, my God, I've had such a beautiful life. And I'm so glad I'm, and I, I would never, never, never do, and then wouldn't, wouldn't let my family near any of that stuff ever, ever. Like, like categorically, it's, it's a everything in, in the science world, folks, is theory, right? And when you trace back the theory and the origins of medicine, you'll see it comes back to like a few guys, many of whom spoke out about this stuff, but which guy did they pick? They they picked the guy that backed their their theory and now we've got this whole big pharmaceutical thing based on like 
one guy who was a bit of a prick, right? Sorry, Gene, I'm going off on one slightly, but you know, I, I, I led the Global Veterans Alliance into battle and and it was a battle. We marched on Downing Street. We, you know, we are not going to let our kids be subjected to these corporate trillionaire psychopaths, right? And you can guess my response to recruits that, that how's it been for yourself? Um, because we're, we're volunteers, it's, it, it, they all kind of assume that everybody's had it. Is 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 what it is. Um, I, I'm like yourself. I know I know people who, who who've who've dropped dead the day after. Mm. Um, I definitely know that there's there's people within my family who've had life changing illnesses now brought upon them, mm. and they're young. Um, my I, I, I'm my my mum. Every time she has one, she's sick, and she's definitely deteriorating. And and it and it's a real worry, but she won't listen to me because she's of the age where whatever the doctor says is true. Um, and I, and I, I guess for for a recruit, it's it's really it's, it's a tough decision um, because it it's what they want to do. But as you say, you know, if it if it's this DNA technology, we don't know what's going to happen. And to me, anything that. Potentially, and it, and this is this is fact. This is science fact, isn't it? That they cut part of your DNA out. So mm. that doesn't sound like a, a good thing to me as a as a logical person. And um, mm. it's all it's up to everybody's choice, and, and and the information's out there if you if you look for it. And it's not all all wacky information. It's from scientists, and 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 now we've got um, you know um, sudden death syndrome within sports personalities and there's there's like crazy fit footballers just collapsing on the floor and mm. um, you know that didn't happen before covid so it's no. like you do the maths and, and again, if they they want to that's what they want to do you know but there is other jobs i don't think the police are forcing it upon them um there's people in the police so it's a similar similar sort of calling isn't it the police the military um and yeah, I get it. It's a difficult one, but I suppose it's personal choice. I, I'm personally, you know, I'm trying to travel abroad to, tomorrow, and I don't know whether I'm going to get checked and turned back. Um, if I do, I do. Don't, you know, I'm non. Uh, that's that's the price you pay, isn't it? Restriction of movement, which is totally, totally wrong and illegal. Really, in well, my it's a, it, it goes against everything you and I fought for, and our ancestors fought for. Well, I, I just see it as you know, uh, and he, it, it's a principal thing, isn't it? That you haven't got, you haven't got, and, and I've listened to some of you and watched you, you know, mm. when you were you were doing that amazing thing down in London, um, and it's 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 the matter of freedom of choice, isn't it? And for for, I mean, thank God they, the this country didn't go down those routes, but they made it pretty hard for people, um. And it is freedom of choice. And if they take away that choice, then then what? Are, if, what you're saying? What have we fought for? Because we're, we're in a dictatorship, aren't we? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Gina, moving on to um, you. Got any? Is that your camper van there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looks yeah. like something out of Star Trek. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a re- what's called a race cruiser. So in the in the back is amazing. So all my all my I do a lot of mountain biking and and I'm quite an outdoorsy person as you probably can gather. I, I love nothing better than just being on the road. Before COVID, I used to go to Spain and spend months in Spain and stuff as what you know running and stuff. So yeah, it's um it's a pretty cool thing and 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 trying to get up to Scotland and Wales and all the glorious parts of the UK and and just as I, as I said earlier just you know li- live live in my life as much as I can mm. and and as I'm getting as I'm getting older I start getting more injuries but I'd rather I'd rather get injured and and have have done crazy wild things while I can than mm. than you know than not live my life but yeah it's, it's a pretty cool thing I won't advertise who built it but <laughs> <laughs> you can if you want it's uh if it helps them um yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Good bit of kit. yes 
And Gina, just tell us, um, there's not many people have bodyguarded Britney Spears, but I believe that's another one of your accolades. Am, am, am yeah, I... so I, I, I didn't see it. So I, I used to live in America and do some um, very, very rich people um, was my clients, um, like very, very, like crazy rich. Like, you know, I used to have a flat in the, nearly in Chicago and I used to live in LA but in LA we've got you've got LA and Beverly Hills and then you've got the posh part of Beverly Hills believe it or not and that's Beverly Park and when you the, the, the ivory gates open there's deers prancing everywhere and and that and it's just remarkable and I used I think we used to live like next to um oh god he wrote, he, he did E.T., Steven Spielberg and Rod Stewart with our neighbours and stuff. Obviously not my money, <laughs> but I was there. Um, and during that time, they, they Britney Spears was going through her, um, her, her, her breakdown of, you know, where she shaved her hair off and, and mm. now it's all come to, like, probably why it happened with her father and stuff. Um, and they wanted me to to take over as a as bodyguard and mentor Um but I, I did actually, I declined it in the end just because I thought once you've you've done a celebrity of that kind, you can never go back into, you know, doing the discreet work, which I do a lot of as well as the CP stuff. So um, I did decline it because she, she was a bit, a, bit, a bit of a wild child at the time. Um, but, yeah, it was certainly, certainly living the high life but without the money. <laughs> Have you had any kind of, you know, shenanigans going there, stuff you've had to deal with. It, it, I guess it's probably controlling the public is a big thing. Yeah. Or, or I mean, fans, I mean. Yeah, the way I, the, the way with, I view sort of CP and stuff is, is, is you, you need to like be sort of a mind reader. So you need to keep the client out of the trouble. So you need to predict what's going to happen. If you like, um, so it's it's kind of like a gift of fear. So we've we've all got it. If you've read that amazing book, it's like if if you feel something's wrong, then then don't do it. You know, if you feel at the alleyway today tonight feels a bit dodgy for some reason, then mm -hmm. take the long way around. And that's how I've always tried to. I mean, obviously, you're trying to control a human who's very rich and influential, um, to not do something that they what they want to do, but. Um, generally, it is sort of the public, um, you know, if they recognise them um, and, and just trying to advise them not to do silly things, um, which a lot of the time they don't listen to, but then you have to mitigate the risk. Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's funny, it's a boring job, but that's what you want it to be. Because when it gets exciting, it's all gone wrong. So, mm. so you want it to be boring. Um, you want it to be mundane and, you know, you're following them like somebody's servants and that type of thing. Um, but, yeah, I've had a few few issues um, on Hollywood v Boulevard with someone coming at them with scissors. Um, and I had to, I had to get, get the client out the way because obviously he's bodyguarding. The idea is, is not to is to get them away from the risk as opposed to expose them to the risk. So you don't, you're not necessarily going to fight the person with the scissors, which is what I I decided to do. I, I got the, pair, the, the, the principal out the way um, by shoving them into a shop and shutting the shop door. And then that, that pair individual went away being nuts somewhere else. Um, and we, we called 911 and, and the police came down and got them. Um, but at the time, the principal was not happy with me because I had touched her for a start and pushed her into a shop. So she, she, she nearly, like, she, she, she used to never say anything at the time, but I did get sort of telling off from her PA later on and I explained what had happened and she was like, oh, all right, okay. <laughs> maybe you should get a bonus. I was like, yeah, maybe you should. <laughs> Are you yeah, and there's, um, there's lots of interest. If, if you're bodyguarding stateside, do do bodyguards carry? It, it dep depends on the um, the state you're in. So within Chicago, we could we could we could be armed within the present the the uh, the um, housing and um, what's it called where they live. 
and the residents. Um, but when we went outside as a residence, we couldn't. But what we used to do was we, we would hire in the backup car undercover police, or well, not undercover, off-duty police. So they would be our backup with, with the gun because we couldn't carry over there. Um, different states did allow us to carry. Um, LA, we couldn't do anything, which was bizarre. But, yeah, so we could only have it in the residence as well. So, mm. yeah, it just depends. And then, then if we move around different countries, um, we could in some places if it was needed, really. But generally, not so much. Just mm. in the residence, we'd have, we'd have um, arms and try and use the local police because they're allowed to moonlight in America, unlike in this country. And they're allowed to take the guns home. So it's like a bizarre place, the state, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a bizarre place it's an incredible place but i'll tell you what the most beautiful people you're ever going to meet on the planet uh, not, not all of them obviously i've met all of them well i've met a few idiots over there but yeah. gen generally speaking just such such kind generous mm. loving people incredible place yeah. to be incredible well it is i found it like, I was only talking about it the other night. I was going, oh, I do love the States. And I've lived, worked in different parts of the States. So I worked in Virginia, and that was a night I was teaching their military, as you can possibly imagine, something um, on a job. So we were, we were over there as contractors um, teaching um, some skills and drills. Um, and that that was awesome. They they were a, a, That was a lovely state. Um, and obviously the, the guys we were working with over there from the US um, Navy were, were awesome as well. Um, but yeah, I do I do miss, if you like, the freedom at the minute of being able to, to, to go back to America and, and explore it a bit more. Mm. Um, it's certainly a, a unique, a unique place, definitely. Very much so. It's all the more reason we should fight for our freedoms, folks, so the youngsters can get a chance to go and visit these incredible places uh, um, and exercise their right for medical freedom. But that's we, we've covered that. Gina, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say this on a podcast, but it's it's been one of my most favourite chats. Um you're an incredible person i'm delighted i'm honored to to be your friend i hope we can do some stuff together in 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 the future um maybe on a bikes or or some running or something um we're gonna yeah uh, definitely friend, definite. yeah friends at home we're gonna uh, put a link for gina's book below and links for uh genus social media etc etc so please get involved in and uh and follow big love to you all if you could like and subscribe if um if that really helps the channel and uh gina let's let's chat again stay stay on the line by the way but for the purposes of the tape let's chat again soon and and massive thank you Definitely. Thanks a lot for having me on. It's been it's been a pleasure, and it's um, definitely great to have, have finally met you and become friends. And we will <laughs> do something something crazy at some point. Yeah. Definitely. Don't beast me though. All right. <laughs> <laughs>